Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the August 8th edition of the Divine Mercy for America Holy Hour Novena for Our Nation. Uh, we are Dave and Joan Maroney, and you can get connected with us at divinemercyforamerica.org. Click on the membership tab and get signed up to get our emails and things like that. And we are excited to have as our guest speaker, he's come uh, and visited with us a few times before, our friend, uh, Mr. Kevin McCarthy, who hails from Indianapolis, Indiana. Mr. McCarthy is a husband, a father, a grandfather. Are you a great grandfather yet? Oh. No, not yet. Not that I know of. I've been, let's, <laughs> let's not me, but we'll, 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 get, we'll get there if it's true. One day, no. future. We have, yeah, we'll get there eventually. And and uh, he is a uh, an attorney and also a licensed theologian, and it's just been a wealth of information and knowledge. And so Kevin, thanks for joining us again today. We're gonna to turn it over to you to share with us more good information about the role of Our Lady, particularly Our Lady of America in these times. Take it away. Okay, well, let's start off with, can we start off with a prayer? Yes, please. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit of Abba and Jesus, come sweet Lord and giver of life. Come through the powerful intercession of the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Come by the infinite merits of the most precious blood of Jesus, poured out on the cross and offered in every mass. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come to give glory to the Father in the Son. Come and enkindle in our hearts the fire of your love, ever greater than before. And come Holy Spirit of Abba and Jesus and make our gifts seraphic in health and humility, in peace, prosperity, prudence, and purity of heart, in truth and in wisdom. And in that Trinitarian holiness of your divine will, which is love and mercy itself, amen. Amen, wow, thank you. So as we discussed, uh, one of the th things I think that we all know, but we need to maybe meditate on more is that in the uh, order of creation and in the order of the incarnation, uh, this Blessed Virgin Mary is manifested as the, the greatest gift of divine mercy external to the Trinity. So. Uh, we have lots of, the church is a gift, a huge gift of mercy, the mystical body of Christ. And the incarnation itself is an immense uh, gift of mercy, but the incarnation is a divine act. That is, it's manifested within the divinity. Because even though our Lord Jesus Christ took on a human nature, he always remained divine. He's entirely divine. He's always God. He's God, a person of the, of the Trinity of God with a human nature. But external, as part of the incarnation, external to the divinity itself is this immensely beautiful, pure, holy creature, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is outside of God himself, the greatest manifestation of the divine mercy. So... We have to remember that because, uh, you know, looking at this in a human way, looking how perfect and uh, infinitely uh, correct God is, Trinity is, when Adam and Eve fell, it was <clears throat> in no way incumbent on God to find us a pathway back. Okay, I mean... God was never obligated to us in any way. We, we, he didn't owe us anything. Now, we owe mercy in the nature of divine mercy to other human beings, and we owe this mercy, and we must practice mercy. But we owe it as a, as a debt of justice. But in justice, in the justice of God, he didn't owe us the incarnation and the redemption but he gave it to us and he gave us in the in the gateway to the incarnation is this second chance this second eve the blessed virgin mary this perfect woman 
who was made so perfect that there wasn't going to be any more mistakes like Eve made when she was tricked by the devil. So we have to remember that the Blessed Virgin Mary is all about mercy and all about passing on to us constant repeated graces and acts of divine mercy. So that's the basic theme that I wanted to talk about, but contextualize it within the devotion to Our Lady of America. And it's interesting since we last talked, I noticed recently the Archbishop of Cincinnati has clarified his involvement with that singular decree and said, oh, this has always been an approved private devotion in some kind of public statement. But um, in, in any event, um, the, 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 the important thing about this the, the divine mercy is that the Blessed Virgin Mary will not be outdone, okay? I don't mean that in the sense that she's prideful. I mean, it's in the sense that if, if, the, if, the, if the church and human beings uh, act in accordance with the Holy Divine Will and do good, she's going to respond to that good and and there's going to be more more from it than simply the goodness of what what has occurred by all these creatures so we see that with the devotion to our lady of america where she was received so well by the early bishops of the united states of america they responded to her in such a perfectly uh straightforward way that it it seemed perfectly logical to her to come to this country and ask through sister mary ephraim and through the her bishop spiritual director to get the bishops of the united states to do this uh, veneration of the virgin mary under the title of our lady of america so i wanted just to explain that because i don't think i explained it and i explained it before i've made some reference to it before but you, you, you know, when you when you understand that the first bishop of the United States, Bishop John Carroll, he was uh, so focused on the truth about the wonderful titles of the Blessed Virgin Mary that he dedicated the country to the Immaculate Conception, which is one of the five dogmas of the Virgin Mary now. We, we talk about our five doctrines of the Virgin Mary. But even after that, he named his cathedral the Cathedral of the Assumption. So the, the old cathedral in Baltimore, which is downtown on Cathedral Street, I think it's down at 320 Cathedral Street in downtown Baltimore, and is a basilica now, that was named after the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, the, the first bishop did that when it was, of course, a wonderful idea and totally permissible, but it wasn't a required dogma for belief. And then subsequent to that, uh, when there were a few more bishops, they asked uh, the Pope to be allowed to to have his approval on the, on the Immaculate Conception. That caused Pius IX to say, well, let's make this a dogma and proposed it to the whole world and had an American bishop hold the decree when he read it in uh, on July, December 8th, 1854 in Rome in the St. Peter's Basilica. That bishop uh, became a, a canonized saint, Bishop Neumann. So going forward then, the, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, the American bishops said, well, let's have this big shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And again, they were proposing to build a building which became the largest church to the Virgin Mary anywhere in the world where there was not a prior private revelation or apparition by the Virgin Mary. She didn't request that. They just gave it to her. So when she comes to Sister Mary Ephraim, she's, she's responding to all of that and she's, she's not going to be outdone. So she, she offers if you'll venerate me under this title, I'll get for you the, the virtue of purity, which I think anyone can see if you consider uh, the Christian virtue of purity in its broadest sense. By that, I mean uh, many people think about it being primarily sexual rectitude, but it's, it's purity and, and it goes, goes, goes beyond that. It's pure in your, 
in your thought, word, and deed for telling the truth and for not being selfish in other ways and to be a, you know, a, a pure child of God and a pure soldier of Jesus Christ. And there, there's a certain virtue to that. And it's important that, uh, that this, that we recognize that she wanted to give that to the entire United States. And again, you, people say, well, I, I don't you know, I don't know why, why, because she's saying, look, I know you all are very attached to my, my work in the church and my titles and you wanna venerate me. So I'm being like any good, really good mother. If you really wanna please your mother, venerate me this way. And then we'll have you know, many more favors. All of that is, is a manifestation of divine mercy. That's all a tremendous kindness that uh, this country desperately needs to make, a, make, make something of it, uh, that the hierarchy does, but please God, they will sooner rather than later. But the point is that's a manifestation of mercy. That's God through the Blessed Virgin Mary saying, I will not be outdone. You're gonna, I'm going to pour even more graces on the United States of America and through the United States of America to the entire world. So that's what I'm talking about, the connection between mercy and the Virgin Mary. And there are many other examples, many other examples. Kevin, um, what about, someone asked me the other day, because I was talk, mentioning, like you said, that the United States, it's uh, the divine... Um, well, will or mandate that this will happen and that the United States will, this gift will, you know, travel around the world as, and we know a lot of people say as the United States goes, the rest of the world goes, but then also where they say in Fatima, our lady says that it's going to be the conversion of Russia, you know, that will have an impact. Do you, and maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, but what about that combination, the role of Russia compared to the role of the United States? Well, the United States and Russia have been competitive for, you know, an entire century, very pointedly competitive um, and, and very aggressively competitive. And we're still yielding the bad fruit of a lot of actions by international communism and Marxism to this very day. Um, the hallmark of communism is to try to develop a uh, really strange or perverse uh, jealousies or envy between groups of people. So the classic one was the working class against the middle class and or the working class against the nobility or whatever. And then, you know, everybody has to be completely equal and, and uh, a kind of a tearing down of existing social and familial uh, structures. But I mean, that's being carried on today, we can see in, in other more modern ways, you know, the people want to engender a bad emotions on by one group of people against another. And um, so I think there's no question we still have that going on. And, and it did start with, uh, with Russia. Um, although I think it's gone, you know, beyond Russia now, I think Russia's maybe involved, but I think Chinese communists are probably involved to a certain extent. They're certainly not refraining from benefiting from it. So yeah, I mean, that's a factor, but the United States of America, it's very important if you're gonna have in a practical way, uh, something opposing that it would seem that just like the Roman empire ended up facilitating the spread of Christianity, the American empire, which we've had an empire since at least 1945, we, we more or less rule the world. And not, you know, it's great. We're not just like the pagans. I mean, they had a lot of Christians in the United States and we have a different code of government and ethics and things like that. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not, we don't have embraced the same val pagan values that Rome had, but we're still, uh, we're still the largest and most important country in terms of influence on the worldwide culture. Now that may change. That may change very soon, and we may fall. But 
so long as we're in this prominent position, it seems that God uses that, just like God used the Roman roads for St. Paul. The Roman roads were first created by Alexander the Great and then improved by the Roman Empire. And without them, St. Paul wouldn't have all the books he's got in the Bible because he wouldn't have been able to make it to all those places. You know, another good, uh, when you mention that example, like you said, since the 40s, we've been the superpower. That had a lot to do with the spreading of the divine mercy message and devotion. Because in Poland, where the Sister Faustina's notebooks were, and the devotion was growing, now they're, after the war, they're locked in communism. So nothing, you know, they couldn't get that message out. And they didn't have the, the technology, the wherewithal, the finances, but by getting that message, as we know that Father Yozhenbosky brought it across, you know, the United States, and even Father Seraphim Mikolenko doing the same thing and getting it here to our country, then this is how uh, it was able to be spread because, you know, we had the quote freedom and the ability to do it. So there's another good example of that. I think you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you look at this, uh, someone mentioned the flame of love and course the flame of love as a devotion is anticipated by the statements of the blessed virgin mary to sister mary ephraim yeah. where she talks about uh the, the, that she wants to see especially young people in the united states be torch bearers of the queen and uh you know the the flame of love really if you think about it as a theologian the flame of love is the holy spirit nothing more nothing less and so the flame of love is the is the spouse of the holy is the spouse of the blessed virgin mary because she's the spouse of the holy spirit if you look at the catechism of the catholic church and i think it's i can't remember exactly i could look it up but i think it's paragraph 1232 it explains that the holy spirit is expressed as a, a, a flame or fire of love so uh the, the but the, the, the some people think that well if, if there just needs to be a lot of people join that movement and then everything will be hunky dory but there's also people believe that about people have a devotion to the divine will as is uh, manifested to uh, an Italian woman uh, Louisa Picaretta but what's unique about Our Lady of America is she's saying I'm going to obtain for the citizens of the United States the virtue of purity and i've written a paper on this which you can find on the internet but that's that's something much greater and not offered by any other devotion she's saying do these acts as a hierarchy and again i've explained why she would honor the hierarchy of the united states that way because they were so forthcoming without any prompting by private revelation for 150 years do 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 what i ask venerate me in this way and i will obtain for all the people of the united states the virtue of purity now does that mean they're all going to take it and they're all going to accept it i i doubt that because people still have free will but if, she, if she's going to get us the virtue of purity she's got to do something fantastic that gets everybody into the state of sanctifying grace why is that and i explained this in this paper that you can get on the internet called our lady of america great expectations the reason is because uh, you can't have a, a, a supernatural virtue like purity. And when she's talking about purity, she's not talking about some practice of modesty that was taught by, you know, even taught by pagans. You know, she's not talking about, you know, upright behavior and involving sexual rectitude or something. She's talking about what the church talks about purity, which is a much, much, much greater thing. And she's talking about the supernatural virtue of purity. Well, you can't, the church teaches, you can't get a supernatural virtue unless you're first in the st state of sanctifying grace. She doesn't explain all that because in every apparition she's ever at, she doesn't explain everything. She, she's normally very economic in what she says. So for instance, at Lourdes, she said, tell the priest that I want processions here. She said that one time. There have been millions of people in processions in Lourdes since she said that. She does not have to say a whole lot. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, by a mere glance from this woman, a mere little glance, 
will do anything she asks. It's as simple as that because she asks perfectly because she never makes a mistake what she asked for. So she couldn't have possibly offered this to the United States if it's not a reality. So it's a matter of faith on the part of the bishops. They need to have the kind of faith that uh, Bishop John Carroll had, that Bishop Neumann had, that uh, the bishops who first started the National Shrine before World War I had. She, you know, if they, if they exhibit that kind of faith and do this act of veneration of taking the statue of Our Lady of America and having a solemn procession to the National Shrine and placing it there so that the image of Our Lady of America is the centerpiece for our National Shrine, not Our Lady of Lourdes, not Our Lady of Fatima, not the Lady of the Miraculous Medal, not Our Lady of Chenstakova. Why, are they there? Yeah, of course they're there because you're honoring, honoring the same person. But uh, she asked that the theme of the National Shrine be her image in a specific way because she's saying, look, in a practical way, you're certainly as good as any of the other, these other Catholic countries with their ancient devotions to me. I want you to have me in a particular way to your country, not to your continent like Our Lady of Guadalupe, but to your nation. I want to honor the good and holy bishops of the 19th and early 20th century. I, and I wanna give you this grace. And I wanna give you this grace with me holding the lily of purity so that you obtain purity because why? Because purity is the gateway to the becoming the temple of the Holy Spirit by sanctifying grace, in which case you have the indwelling Trinity within you. And if you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, you have the flame of love. So, and this is to be done in a way that's instrumental and as far as I can tell, instantaneously. So you could say, well, why do the bishops have to do this? Well, we, we have a hierarchical church. We only have certain men who are separate and set apart and granted the authority to do certain magnificent things, including absolve sins in the sacrament of penance reconciliation by private and individual confession, and to confect the body and blood of Christ on a daily basis. So you may say, well, I, I don't know why she doesn't do it. Well, who, who cares? We, we're in a hierarchical church, and it's these men who do these things. So it's perfectly honorable and appropriate and fitting for these same group of bishops who are ministers to do a sacramental act and carry this statue into the National Shrine, honor her, and yield yield this great benefit and mercy i mean that's an immense mercy a grace that will cause most of the people of the united states to be converted to the sanctifying state of sanctifying grace and on top of that being given the the the, the, the supernatural habit of purity it's outstanding so they just need to have the faith and and basically the love of our lady to go forward with it so that's 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 my message that's mercy we don't deserve it. No, that's the whole, nobody deserves it. Even the good bishops didn't deserve it. But that's the nature of divine mercy. It goes so far beyond. It's not that we deserve it. It's that she loves us. She's our mother by baptism and she wants to give it to us. And she's obtained it from her father, her son, and her spouse, the Holy Spirit. She's obtained the right and power to pass on this grace, but she can't do it alone because we're in a hierarchical church. She needs the hierarchy. She needs the ministers to do the ministerial act and obtain these graces. It's as simple as that. Kevin, that's that was an excellent, I think, synopsis of the whole message of Our Lady of America and why Beautiful. I mean, really, really helpful. Um, to you know, me. The point is you're a mother, right, John? Yeah. Yes. And, you know, your children aggravate you sometimes and they don't do the right thing and so forth and so on. But you, you would do anything for your children like that. Right. Okay. Well, wh why does someone question that the Virgin Mary wants to do that and has the powerful influence with the Trinity to do it. Who, why, why would you question that? She, anything that's consistent with the will of God 
and the conversion of souls, the church teaches that the highest thing that any human creature can do, especially when they're a Catholic, when they're baptized, they're in the church, the highest form of worship is the conversion of sinners to the state of grace in order to give glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the highest form, that's the biggest gift that anybody can return to God. We can't really give him a gift, but it, we, we describe it as a gift. You want to do something, give something to, to in justice, honor God? Get souls. I mean, what did Jesus say on the cross? I thirst. Okay, what's going to happen when you get your final judgment? He's going to show you in waves of love how you disappointed him throughout your life. That's the reality. So he, he, he doesn't want to be disappointed. He, he wants you to, so he's saying, well, I, uh, the Blessed Mother has kind of an angle on this. She's, she's kind of, because these early bishops were so gratuitously good in the way they treated her her dogmas and the way they advanced them and uh she's obtained from trinity the ability to use to use that as the as the platform for purification of the united states and then of the whole world 